Hello. It's the 11th of December, 2015, and this is episode 36 of the Unseen Podcast. To learn more about the Unseen Podcast, visit unseenpodcast.com. We are a spinoff of the Wow Signal. If you want to learn more about the Wow Signal Podcast, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. Tonight, joining me are Adam Smith. Hello. Uh, James Garrison. Hello, everybody. Now, by the way, we're pretending James has a bad cold. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Marsha Barnhart. Hi, it's good to be with you again. And Nick Nielsen. Hello, Paul, and hello to the Unseen Podcast audience. Right. Uh, so, now, folks, uh, as you know, when about three or four weeks in advance, we start a topics thread on the Google Plus community for the Unseen Podcast participants. By the way, if you want to be involved in that, just uh, send me an email at unseenpodcast at gmail.com and I'll, I'll show you, tell you how you can get in uh, and participate in the topics discussion as well as become a panelist. So we started that, and we've had about 20 posts, and it seems like we're leaning toward, for this week, we're leaning towards exoplanets as the topic. Exoplanets have been a very important uh, feature of of scientific inquiry in the last, oh, I don't know, 10, well, probably since about the uh, early 90s when uh, people like Jeff Marcy started discovering exoplanets around other stars uh, in large numbers. They discovered quite a large number. Then Kepler was launched, and now Kepler is discovering huge numbers of exoplanets. And there are new missions planned in the near future, both American and European and possibly others, that will find more exoplanets. Uh, so the, the numbers of exoplanets have grown from zero in... When, when I was a uh, young adult, to thousands now. How many are? How many do we have now, Adam? Do you know? Right off the top of your head. Well, the Kepler seven, the seventh version of the Kepler list has just been released, and there are eight thousand, something like eight thousand six hundred candidate planets. Of those, around four and a half thousand have been confirmed. But that's that's just. The ones that have been found with Kepler. If you add on all the others, you, it's a couple of thousand, a couple of thousand exoplanets. The first one was uh, 1995, 51 Gassy B. Right. Was found by uh, a Swiss team, Didier Quayle and uh, Michel Mayer, using the radial velocity measurement. Right now, and it, yeah. And in the old in the old days, we they used to what they would do was they would look at how a star sort of wobbles a little bit, and uh, by the old days, yeah. I mean 1995. Uh, actually, they're still doing that. Yeah, uh, and they would they would uh, very sensitively measure these. They would see a periodic signal in these in these wobbles, which would indicate that the there was something orbiting the star, and of course that's going to detect. Big planets, right? Jupiter size plus planets. They've gotten better. Yeah. They've gotten better. They can now detect smaller planets with that same technique. But Kepler looks at planets moving across the face of the star between the star and the Earth, and a very, very, very slight decline in the brightness of the star over a short period of time. And then it comes back around again. And if you keep seeing that, uh, you conclude there's something there. Uh, and that's been incredibly successful, although more difficult than anybody anticipated. Uh, and Kepler's only also looking... Known as the transit yeah. method. Yeah. And, and Kepler only look, has only looked at a small patch of the sky so far, uh, is now looking at a bit of a different part of the sky. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's... You know, we've only, we've only really... St- explored a tiny fraction 
uh, of stars. And those stars that have planets that are orbiting so that they pass between the Earth and the star, that's a small percentage of the total number. So if estimated it's, to be about 10 percent, yeah, maybe 12 percent. Yeah, I think it's probably, yeah, uh, it may be smaller. It depends on the size of this planet, right? I mean, for the big planets, you can you can see more of them with the smaller planets less, which is why we don't have very yeah. don't have very many Mars sized planets in the catalog yet. Uh, in fact, probably none there, that are Mars sized. Yeah, there are there are one or two. Yeah, but, but not many. Uh, we in have. Two, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go on, Paul. Well, uh, I just well I was, in uh, Kepler, the Kepler Space Telescope began work in. 2009, staring at the same patch of sky in the constellation of Cygnus. Mm -hmm. And it looked at 160,000 stars simultaneously in this one small patch of sky over right. its about three years it was active for before it broke, unfortunately. Well, now we're into Kepler 2 mission, right? Which is a, a slow scan yeah. across the sky, which is uh... looking. The uh, the ecliptic plane, basically. Right. What happened was a couple of wheels uh, failed on Kepler, and uh, as they do. Well, the, these the particular type of wheel does yeah, has been ha, doesn't have a very good reliability record. Uh, the same company has made better wheels that are that perform beautifully for very long periods of time. So, uh, but the kept these are called the B. Did they ever the B wheels. <laughs> Why don't they ever fit spares? Well, they did. They had a spare. Why don't they? They had, really? Yeah, they had four wheels, and they they failed two of them. Uh, right. Wait, this but is... you guys, aside from the discovery of these planets, what kind of data has been garnered, if any? Well, there's been well, a tremendous well, amount of uh, huge amounts of data. But the, uh, on board, it's filtered down a bit, quite a bit, because they have to get it over a radio link to Earth. But and they don't they're not constantly in contact with Earth. They they have these downlink uh periods. So th there's a limited amount of data they can get down. But the the, the astronomers are ability of stars from You just from muted, at... Paul. Oh. You just muted. Unmute. Sorry. There you go. Nope, you muted again. I'm I'm all right. All right. Yeah. Uh the, the astronomers have been learning a lot about uh the normal variability of stars uh that they didn't know before this mission. So anything on density and makeup? Well, a little bit, yeah. But it's it that kind of information's usually learned from studying the star with a ground-based telescope. Uh what we're studying this telescope is not big. And its purpose is to just measure the brightness of the star over a fairly wide band of of uh of of light and determine how that ver how look for s subtle variations in it in the star and th this takes a tremendous amount of technology uh and understand what good understanding of of how this sort of thing works <laughs> well before it was launched they had to do a lot of astronomy to make sure it was they knew what they were doing um the the software is very sophisticated and uh looks at and takes out all the variations in the star's brightness that are expected to be there naturally and without a planet and then what's left over is what a planet should cause which and it's typically it's like one percent of variation it's not a very large variation at all uh, but if it re if it's consistent and repeats you probably have a planet and if it keeps repeating you certainly have a planet Someone has compared the the amount of dimming to a uh, a fly sitting on the front of a huge spotlight. Right. It, it's that. Well, it, it's you'd probably kill the fly, <laughs> but uh, the yeah the the uh, it, it's it's a very slight amount of dimming. Even for the very big planets, it's not much more. It, it, even a huge super Jupiter type planet isn't going to dim the star that much, and it's just. It, a, question of, of the relative sizes they're, they're not they're not that much uh you know jupiter for example our jupiter is roughly these are very rough numbers roughly 
10 times larger than the Earth in diameter. And the Sun is roughly 10 times bigger than Jupiter in, in diameter. Now, which means in area, it's about 1%. So if Jupiter passes in front of our Sun, relative to some observer way out in space, they're going to see about a 1% dimming. Roughly. I mean, the, yeah. these are the round numbers, not, not trying to get them <clears throat> exact. So that that's... Uh, now, they would see that. If they waited several years, they'd see it again. And if they waited several more years, they'd see it again. Seven. Yeah. Eleven years. Yeah. Ele- yeah. That's- a long time. Uh, and they would eventually... Uh, Conclude that there was a planet passing in front of the star. So, so there's a there's a bias for planets that are close in and have short periods because they uh, we had more time to look at those. That's one of the unfortunate consequences of the uh, the Kepler space telescope breaking when it was three years into its mission. Well, that actually was that was it, it was that was its mission. I believe it it's it survived uh, the minimum requirement, but oh yeah. Uh, but if it had gone on, if it had gone on to look at the same field of view, it would have been able to characterize planets with a much longer orbital period. That's true. Like and, I said, and and, and that yeah, Jupiter is only well, it had, I say only it has an eleven-year orbit. So, uh, an alien race looking at us with a with a an equivalent Kepler space telescope would never have seen any of our planets because it wasn't looking for long enough well it wouldn't have been able to see an earth-sized planet it would have been able to see jupiter saturn maybe neptune and uranus but because their orbits are are just too too long it didn't have enough time to look Mm -hmm. there are and there are some planets that have, have recently been looked at again because this the scientists that look at the kepler data need three transits really to make a, a positive discovery of a planet they like to see three transits and there are there are a great number of planet candidates that only have two transit you know data from two transits or even one transit so that they have been going back over the catalog recently and looking to see if there are further planets in the data that have these longer periods. And they, they have found some. They've found around half a dozen just recently, mainly Jupiter-sized planets, a uh, couple of super-Earths. Uh, I think the, the biggest take-home from the, the Kepler mission has been the incredible variability in the size and characteristics of different planets. Before... Kepler started work, we didn't, well, I say before Kepler started, before astronomers started looking at exoplanets over the past 20 years, we we didn't know that there was anything like a hot Jupiter or a super Earth or there seems to be now a whole range of planet sizes going from smaller than Mercury right up to bigger than Jupiter, with, with no discernible break in the pattern. You get planets of all different sizes. There, there will be a, a cutoff between rocky planets and, and those that are ice giants, gas giants, but where that break lies, we're, we're still not sure. Somewhere in the super-Earth regime, there'll be a, a difference between a terrestrial rocky planet that's one and a half times bigger than the Earth, say, and a, a similar sized planet that's mainly hydrogen and helium. We've yet to discern the difference, but uh, we'll get there. Yeah, there no, some ex- yeah, new there, there's, the there's some new, new, yeah, there, there's a couple of them uh, that I know of, uh, and I, I know that uh, we're going ahead with TESS, which is. Yeah. Uh, and, te- and there's a similar mission out of Europe called Plato. That's right, yeah. Which is a couple Tess of years is- behind TESS, I believe. But Yeah, TESS, due to launch in 2018, will look at the uh, the brightest stars in the solar neighborhood, 
that's that's going to be another transit detection mission mm -hmm. and it should be able to characterize most of the solar neighborhood those planets that are aligned so that we can see them from our point of view we should be able to detect down to earth size and below hopefully yeah and plato, plato is also going to look at for similar i mean yeah, so sun like sun like stars that are not as far as as yeah. kepler about 2023 i think that's due to launch yeah so years later yeah the, the uh I, plato is still working through its uh its science objectives but i think they're pretty well done with they're getting close to being done with that uh but yeah uh, yeah i'm pretty it's gonna happen yeah it's it seems to me like plato's real uh by the way i did a wow signal uh or half of a wow signal uh episode on plato uh about a year and a half ago so i have a link to that in the show notes i spoke to anna harris who's one of the scientists on plato um the uh now so hopefully the lessons learned on kepler which which are you know the fact that stars have a little bit more natural variability than we thought and there's also uh a lot of uh uh you know, we're going to, there's a bias in what kepler's discovered certainly kepler's discovered a lot of big planets that are close in and a small number of planets that are smaller than that but closer in and it's very hard for it was very hard to get a um you know to to get the the more earth like planets although they did discover a few and if you go to Abel Mendez's site uh which is the planetary habitability lab he compare he has there a list of planets that are most earth like now there's some controversy about whether earth like means most habitable but since the only habitable planet we know of for sure is earth then Looking at Earth similarity seems to make sense at least for now until we have more information. We always yeah. use that. We always use that habitable yardstick, though, as uh, habitable to us. You know, we we have no right. Clue well, we what have kinds no, of we critters don't, are running around. We don't know what else would be habitable, right? I mean, uh, it no, may we, it may be that Titan, for example, Saturn's moon, is habitable to certain types of organisms that have nothing whatever to do with earth life in terms of how they how right. they uh their basic biochemistry uh, so we're really constrained right out of the box when we talk about habitable and we keep it so you know human centric well I, I, I wish scientists would think bigger sometimes oh they do they do they, but, but they yeah. do they do yeah. uh, i mean i mean they they are well aware of the fact that we only have one sample when it comes to life right uh so they well, do not really i i would disagree with that here on earth we have a, a lot of variables that come from a lot of different climate zones and you know like down at down at fishers at the bottom of our sea is um, a typical kind of planetary condition that you might find on certain stars it's really 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 hot and there's still critters that actually survive there so there's that well in terms of habitability though i mean uh I, th I think if you talk to astrobiologists which i do they they are well aware that we they're, we have we, that only, the only biology we know about is is on earth and we only know of a single origin on earth although there are some bio astrobiologists who say there may have been more than one origin we just haven't found it yet uh but uh, there, there's also a question of when you when you break it down into by molecular phylogeny and you come to the 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 archaeans, the bacteria and the eukaryotes, whether they they all have the same origins or whether the uh, later gene transfer assimilated them to being biologically as similar as they are now. But uh, it, it's it's not only. A question of second origins is not only a question, or I should say, exclusively a question of uh, a separate um, uh, what 
astrobiologists sometimes call weird life, which is life not like our DNA-based life, but also the question of whether bacteria and archaea have the same origins as uh, as uh, eukaryotes. Well, that seems to be lost in history if they if they don't, because we we have the same basic. I mean, uh, I, what is it? We have sixty percent of our genes shared with the yeast. Uh, <laughs> our cousin, the yeast. Yeah, well, actually, I'd prefer. Yeah, but but it, 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 it was a very there was a very interesting recent paper. I don't have it at the uh, tip of my tongue now about the the early life on Earth was was very little differentiated, and there was probably a, a very long period of time, millions, maybe tens, maybe hundreds of mil- millions of years of primarily horizontal gene transfer prior to the the vertical gene transfer that we primarily see in contemporary organisms. Yeah. But now that this is taking into account the fact that perhaps much, if not all, um, of what we call life today might have been delivered to us from out there, you know, crashing in here and, and finding a fertile little niche. Um, uh, I'm thinking we should go that direction, certainly. Well, I mean, that that would be the same thing as if, but it's the same genesis, though. I mean, it, it's whether it was here or Venus or Mars. Or well, yeah, depending on where it came from, you could have you could have five different plant, uh, five different parents, so to speak, delivering five different kinds of things that that mingled down here and and found fertile ground. Um, you know, the sky's the limit, literally. Oh. That's how I think. That's that's the broadness that I incorporate. We here. don't we don't know for sure, but it's it's thought that it's possible that either Venus or Mars or possibly both of them were habitable early on. Um, possibly even before Earth was, uh, and because recent results seem to show that uh, there's evidence of Earth life very early, almost before it was e- just just to, as soon as it was possible to have life, we had life, which uh, uh, like, yeah, within a billion years for sure. Yeah, and possibly and even like- sooner. Uh, maybe like half a billion years. Hmm. Uh, now that that's you know you have to understand that what was going on at that time was we were getting hammered. The late with, heavy bombardment. Yeah, with all kinds of heavy. And it, rem- it remains a question of whether life appeared before the late heavy bombardment and then was extinguished and then came back again, or as Marcia says, it could have been delivered repeatedly from multiple sources. Uh, speaking of which, I recently learned a term from one of the papers out in the past few weeks that was widely circulated already on archive, which is lithopanspermia, which is this transfer of matter uh, that brings life with it between uh, planetary bodies, but presumably also um, that could include moons and uh, dwarf planets as well, possibly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. asteroids get around. Asteroids get around, comets get around, they're spewing stuff out, and that's just the things we know of. Litho, now talk a little bit about that litho, what did you say? Yeah, the the word that I was in one of the papers, I can look it up and you can put it in the show notes, was lithopanspermia, litho Uh being the the word for rock. Uh And so it means the the transfer of of life by means of the transfer of rock, which uh-huh. we know, and as Paul has pointed out in previous episodes of the Unseen Podcast, is the planets of the intersolar inner solar system regularly exchange um, uh, mass between them. If you get a hard enough impact, it'll blow stuff off the surface of Mars or Venus or Earth or the Moon, and they and eventually it falls uh, to another planetary body or to mm-hmm. another moon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you know, um, it's kind of on the same subject, didn't I think I was reading recently that that astronauts on the International Space Station or maybe it was the SST. I don't I mean, no, International Space Station found um, microorganisms on the outside of their windshield. Had you heard that? Yeah, I'm not sure that's really been confirmed. Well, uh, OK, but it, it was it was on one of the Russian modules. And yeah, uh, yeah that's right. And now, uh, I'm not sure. If, I, I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, everybody believes that 
but let, they haven't just proven it, for example. So if, if you think about that, that expands what it was known to us to even fathom that things could live out in space like that. Things that live on our Earth now ha can live in space in that environment. That really widens thinking, don't you think, if that is <laughs> factual? Actually, we already knew something about that because uh, an early probe sent to the moon prior to the Apollo missions, uh, apparently someone sneezed inside it before it landed on the moon. And when the astronauts went there, they cut off some of the pieces of one of these earlier probes. I can find the details later. And they brought it back <laughs> and they found some living germs on the inside of this... Uh, um, Space snot? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was from a human being, but it spent several years on the cold, irradiated, oh, airless surface of the moon before it was brought back to Earth. And and multiplied. Yep. No, it just it, it didn't multiply, but it was it was still alive in in a in a yeah. in a ger in a germ like sense. There'd be nothing for it to eat, so it would have to sort of yeah, go yeah. into stasis. But yeah, you don't know. Single cell. <laughs> well. Space snot. You don't. You don't know what space snot needs to survive. Well, it need. It needs uh, <laughs> to 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 grow to to create more of itself. It's going to need raw material. And, and but we then, don't know. Metabolize. Yes. Yeah. And we don't really have a, a any idea the wide range of things that exist on planetary bodies that are transiting to and from all the time. You've, they found micro. Um, they found water. Uh, what they have, they term that, you know, like I was mentioning to you on Comet 67P, they found molecular oxygen on 67P. So, wow, that's pretty cool. Well, water wasn't a big surprise because we detected it before in Comet, uh, but uh, space, space not could live on that. Maybe, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's it's it'd be hard to do. Uh, I mean, Rosetta wasn't set up to do a, a biology mission. Mm -hmm. uh, it, comets spend most of their existence in very deep cold. Deep space, yeah. yeah. It's cold. It's really cold. And there doesn't seem to be any way for energy to, to you know, there's not a lot of free energy. And free energy is what life, as we understand it, thrives on. Uh, now, life could maybe, you know, it's very cold on Titan, too. But Titan does have a kind of a a flux of free energy of, as as weak as it might be. Um, oh, I see Nick found the link to the uh, Moon Micro. Uh, but uh, but but it, it it the the link that I provided there it's uh, it says that there, there's an alternative explanation. So what I said may may have been inaccurate. So okay. we're gonna have to look into that further. Yes. Well, uh, we'll have that in the show notes, of course. Uh, by the way, you can't see it, but the panelists are set, are shooting me links about every three or four minutes <laughs> uh, on the hey, chat. Yes, we got a Pat has got a question, and then we have a, a statement from a new person in the. But uh, Paul, Pat's question is: When does test fly? Twenty eighteen. Is that right, Adam? Yes, 2018, yeah. What was the question again? Tess. And then, oh. But when does Tess fly? The thing, and then, so can it survey something? Yeah, it, it, um, it, it's a... Uh, and then... <clears throat> go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was reading the next uh, statement here. And it's from Jason Higley. I hope I'm saying the last name right. Oh, Higley. Yeah, yeah, Jason. He sure. Says, okay. He says that the next generation transit survey is underway at ESO's Paranal Observatory in Chile. Uh, first light was a year ago. And then he goes on a, another one saying... He asked Margaret Race and Janice Bishop at SETICON one if there were any extreme Earth, or Earth extreme out that they would choose being hardy enough like tardigrades if enclosed in a rock would permit panspermia. And they said that they wouldn't need to be as hardy as 
tardigrade. Yeah. Did you guys get that question? I, it was broken up for me. I didn't quite understand what it was. Is it something about uh, tardigrades uh, and being hardy enough to survive uh, the? Uh, yeah, that, he was asking that, about extreme environments. Miles. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, there, there, there is a. It's hard for a, a, any living thing to survive inside a rock for millions of years, <laughs> even if it's just a single cell. There was a, an experiment, the uh, Phobos Grunt mission, which was a joint European Russian mission that never happened because the spacecraft never made it out of Earth orbit. Right, I remember that, 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 yeah. That had tardigrades on board that were going to go to the Martian moon Phobos. They were going to take them there, leave them there for a bit, and then bring them back and see if they were still alive. And I, I'm quite sure that they would have been. They're extremely hardy little creatures water bears aren't they Tarty yeah grades. they're extremely small uh Very you, cool you, creatures. they're they're cute but all the pictures you see of them are are <laughs> micro photographs uh they're probably i too- read recently that, um they found nematoid worms miles down in the very deepest mines in uh, South Africa, I think, in some gold mine. Hmm. They found these worms that are living two or three miles down. Hmm. Things because that are living in... Ex- sulfur. Say again. Oh, they live on sulfur? Uh, uh, using oh, sulfur they live on sulfur, their... yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was going to say that things that live in extreme environments here on Earth that we know of, and we can extrapolate that out there in, in the great unknown, those things that live in extreme environments probably have adaptations we haven't really even thought about yet. We think that, that uh, you know, they would die under X conditions. It could be they have a mechanism to go into an absolute state of immobilization for eons and that they're brought back out of it under proper conditions and that they don't lose their viability uh, under these conditions. We, we don't know what's out there, but certainly finding the extreme things that are living on our own planet inform us that there is great variability in the viability of living things. Mm. Life finds a way. Certainly on Earth. It would yeah. seem. That's one thing we know about life. It will find a way. There, you and know. That, uh, that gives me, sorry. That gives me a lot of hope that we are not alone. I'm quite sure we're not. It, logically. The Kepler finding, be. the Kepler finding of planets, couldn't have come as a big surprise to scientists, right? I mean, they had to have known in the vastness that there were other planets and such. But I guess what came as a surprise is how many have been found so quickly. Well, it's not really that big a surprise. Uh, No, I wouldn't think so. I mean, you don't get that something like that funded if it's just, if it's just uh, a A complete shot in the dark. Uh, Uh But well, I mean, the question was how many and what kind of planets are there? And and will this work with, will this technique for finding planets work? Uh, you know, using because the reason the reason, the reason they use a satellite is because you get outside the Earth's atmosphere, you eliminated a lot of the variability in the in the uh, brightness of a star. Uh, the stars you're now looking at natural variations and not variations in the atmosphere or variations in condition in conditions that are. Uh, you know, even on the top of a, a high mountain on a desert, you you still have a lot of variability that's introduced by the Earth and not by and not by the star itself. So uh, this was a this was a trying to answer the question: Is this a good way to detect planets? Answer is yes, it is. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh huh. It and what kind of planets will we detect? Well, that's what they found. I mean, you know, they they uh, they have found a decent number of Earth like planets and. and it's probably five to ten percent of the stars that we could even hope to detect this planets on this way. So it's a much it's a small sample of a much larger population of planets. And uh, so yeah. Uh 
the estimates are that there's probably at least as many planets as stars uh, and over overall numerically, and there's probably more than that. Uh, so, I think that the, something like 1.4 planets per star is the best estimate we have at the moment. Yeah, and I'm sure that'll bounce does, around a bit, but doesn't make sense exactly, but. I'm sure you know well, what I mean. Do they know then if they're from this now, can they tell from the Kepler experiment and, and uh, what it was good at and what it was limited at? It, can they design another way to perhaps better detect planets other than just a transit type of observation? Is there some other way to do it that they know now? Well, what, one oh, thing yeah. that can conclu- Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Go. One thing One thing that's very obvious and has already happened is that once Kepler has discovered a planetary system, then ground-based telescopes have focused in on them with the radial velocity method and uh-huh. you know, with, with multiple data points from different methods, uh, much more detailed um, planetary information has been forthcoming once we know that there, it's worth looking at something for uh, its, uh, it, it, it's, its planetary system. And you know, the, these- what, uh, once, it's, once it's detected, we have ways to look at it, but the detection rate of things is, is well. It's really question. more a question of of uh, you know you have this very expensive telescope, and what do you point it at, right? Well, if you if you know there's something there already, mm-hmm. then it's much easier to make a case for pointing at that thing. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, the, and the, the Kepler uh, planets uh, or stars and planets are not particularly close, and I think the uh, the other other planet finding missions that are upcoming will will focus on much uh, a much a closer sample, and when we focus ground based telescopes on closer samples for radio velocity method, uh, we'll get correspondingly better and more precise information. Yeah. That and the radio velocity methods have gotten a lot better over the years with uh, some amazingly uh, difficult uh, technology. Th- these guys. What what they do is is very impressive, uh, but and they're able to they're able to do radio velocity measurements on many stars at once, uh, which is and, and they have they're using telescopes that uh, well I know the 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 a European telescope uh, called that that is in planning called the overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name. <laughs> <laughs> because they they ran they had the very large telescope and then they just and and that that one was taken already so uh the big mofo that needs to be the next one yeah the big, the big mofo satellite um yeah well we're gonna have to get more creative a telescope <laughs> uh yeah. but it has to be something it has to be an acronym that makes sense in multiple languages though i think uh, uh, <laughs> but uh there are all, all I'm but sorry. That's that's the uh direct image the 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 most promising new method for looking at planets is to directly image them to take a picture we are the the first generation of people to actually see a picture of another planet around another star right there's only about half a dozen of them at the moment Mm -hmm. but there are some very good new instruments being made being (laughs) hooked up do some of these big telescopes. There's uh, the uh, Gemini yeah. planet in Chile. There's one called Sphere, uh, and these should be uh, pretty game changing. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's also uh, there's also it, yeah there 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 was there was on the books a U.S. mission called the Terrestrial Planet Finder, which had a uh, the the objective was to very in a very clever way to block the light from the star so you can see just the light from the planet yeah uh, that that was not that was that is no longer funded but i think something like that will come along eventually uh i think it it's being uh aren't they supposed to be doing that with the the w first mission the the telescope that was given to nasa by the um was it the NRO? I don't think it will have that it's kind fine. of occlusion capability that TPF would have had, but no, uh, but it's going to have a correct on it. Yeah, well, it might be able to do something, but it, 
you'll see big planets. You won't see little ones. The terrestrial oh. planet finder would have seen, could have seen, uh, you know, as the name suggests, smaller planets, uh, like, like our own, uh, the, that, that, that mission is not going to happen for quite a long time now. I think, uh, the, the money, the money, uh, had to be taken away because the James Webb space telescope needed more money. And that was one of the ones that missions, uh, that like Lisa, which was at that time, partly funded by the U S uh, uh, the earth, the U S withdrew its funding for that because of, uh, because, you know, we needed, we needed billions of dollars more to, to fund James Webb. So, uh, that's kind of, uh, where we are with the, you know, there, there's a, there's a James, tremendous potential to do that, though, in the long run. It's hoped that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to play a big role in characterizing exoplanets. Yeah, the exoplanets that are found by missions like the TESS mission will hopefully be characterized in the infrared by uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. But there is a problem that uh, astronomers have found recently using the uh, Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer, uh, the Infrared Space Telescope, and that is that many of these exoplanets appear to have very flat, featureless spectra. When they look at, try and uh, look at the atmosphere of these planets, you can, <clears throat> you can look at a very thin sliver of a planet's atmosphere as it goes in and out of a transit across its star. And if you look at that light through a, a spectrograph, you can find out what chemical elements are in the atmosphere. Very difficult thing to do, but it has been done. But unfortunately, half the time it appears that these atmospheres are either covered in a, some sort of metallic haze or, or just completely featureless like uh, Uranus, say. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't give us a lot of information about what's going on under the atmosphere. So uh, there have, there's been some interesting work done recently looking at um, reflected light and polarized light and uh, rally scattering of an atmosphere to work out what its color is. We're, we know that the Earth is we refer to it sometimes as the pale blue dot. If we can use those sorts of techniques to find other pale blue dots around other stars, it might give us some sort of information about the planet itself and whether it's habitable. It, it depends if it's in a habitable zone, of course, and the size of the planet. But gradually we are peeling back layers of information about other planets it's uh it's going to be a long time before we're ever able to send a spacecraft to visit one of them if if ever i'm rather dubious about that the whole space flight interstellar thing but um it just interests me enormously planets are the one thing that really does interest me seeing the incredible variety of what's out there and possibilities for for life right now we we've uh i remember when we we didn't really have any idea what the second and third terms in the drake equation were now the, the drake equation is an attempt to uh approximately estimate in a very rough rough order magnitude sort of estimation how many how many civilizations there could be out out there that we could talk to uh, the first three terms are pretty much astronomical terms. That is, how many stars are does the galaxy produce every year over the you know on average over the last several billion years? Uh, and the second one is, is how many of those you know, how many planets are in each star, and how and then the third one is how many of those planets are habitable, and habitability is still something that scientists are battering around quite a bit as as you know depends on what you mean by habitable right so but we have 
if if you assume that it has to have liquid water, which is a big assumption, we can we can actually estimate the second and third terms in the Drake equation reasonably well. And uh, that is something that we didn't have when I was thirty years old. Indeed, uh, I can I can remember. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the time when uh, before exoplanet discoveries, and it was an open question. And there were scientists who maintained that there the that there were few or no other planetary systems, and and the, our planetary system was unique or nearly so. And there were others who maintained uh, it was uh, planetary systems were probably commonplace. And so for for those who thought planetary systems were probably commonplace, the Kepler data is a, a confirmation of their intuitions. And now, eventually, I, not now, but eventually, we move on to the next step of sampling exoplanet atmospheres, and then we can start quantifying the, the, the biological term in the Drake equation. Yeah, no, that's going to be a tough one. Right? <laughs> We're either going to have to get lucky and find a nearby planet that we can... that we can... Uh, you know, find clear bio signatures on, or I, I I think that if if planetary systems are as common as they seem to be, we can expect that that nearby planetary systems like Alpha Centauri and and uh, uh, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani uh, probably have um, uh, other at planets with atmospheres, even if they're not in the habitable zone and that will be the first step and from there we'll we'll move outward and i i I really do think that we'll have that information once we spend the money to get it well the other thing is if if we went if we go to enceladus right or or europa and we find clear evidence of an independent genesis of life there then i think we have the fourth term in the drake equation reasonably well nailed down uh, yes, yes, we can do it in our own solar system. Once again, if we pay the money to get that information, we can have it. The uh, now you'd have to you'd have to have enough information to say yes, this is not panspermia. This is clearly a, an, an independent genesis, and it the these things are these bugs are very different from any bugs we've ever seen anywhere else, and. Uh, that, and then you can say, well, okay, looks like that fourth term of the Drake equation is pretty much 1.0. Wherever life can exist, it does. I mean, it might be, it might be 0.5, it might be, it, but it's not, it's not going to be 0. 0.001 or anything like that. So, uh, you know, to get it nailed down with an order of magnitude is is a triumph. It and, would be, I agree. And uh, that tells us that. Okay, the next big hurdle, you know, well, the next, we, we won't go into that tonight, but there's, there's three more big hurdles in the Drake equation <laughs> that we should probably we take. To, each one is a, is a complete episode. Well, that we one think, you just we, mentioned, Paul, you mean to tell me they, they won't take into account in that equation panspermia? No, uh, it, no, I mean, no, I'm saying that if you, no, the problem is if it is panspermia, then that, then you, only have to have a single genesis, which could have been an extremely rare event. If it was an independent genesis, that means it's not an extremely rare event, or not likely to be an extremely rare event. Uh, and, and we could potentially, within our own planetary system, we could get a very strong conversa- uh, confirmation of independent, because it's not, as you pointed out, it's not just Enceladus and, and, and Europa, but there are many moons of the Jovian planets, which appear to have subsurface oceans. And if we were to discover a different biosphere in each single one of those subsurface oceans, that would be very strong evidence that it's it's 1.0 in terms of if, where life yeah. can arise. It does arise. Now, I, I have a question here. What When you're saying independent genesis, tell me exactly what you mean by that. Life originates independently and not is not seeded from elsewhere in a well, panspermia event. We don't even know that here. How in the hell are we, we going we, to expect to assign that to some equation? Well, we can't even figure it out on our own planet. Well, if we can look, if we, we can make it, a good to guess. That's just yeah. necessarily 
narrow. Well, well, obviously, we would compare it to life on Earth, and we would see how similar, how different it was. And and, and as and a passage I love to quote from from Carl Sagan, he said, "Our first instance of extraterrestrial life is going to deprovincialize our biology because we only have the provincial provincial biology of Earth in front of us. But our first sample." whether it's, you know, even if it's related to biology on Earth, it's going to have experienced adaptive radiation and is going to evolve significantly different if it's separated by billions of years elsewhere in the solar system. We're going to learn a lot from that first sample, whether it's related to us or not. Yeah, for example, if we found fossil life on Mars, which I'm kind of optimistic we will at some point, uh, I, I don't think there's, there's probably not a whole lot of extant life on Mars, but if if we found fossil life on Mars, and, and then if we studied it, and it would this would take generations. It's not something we're going to conclude instantaneously. And we just we may decide, oh, this is intimately related to life on Earth. This probably came from a panspermia event. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, or we came from them. Uh, yeah. Well, this. Yeah. But right. we are related, is what you're saying. They yeah. would find we have a not... common ancestor. Okay. Uh, but if and you know on Mars, I would think that would be uh, that would be a safe bet. Uh, yeah. On Enceladus, not so much. Uh, uh, or even further out, you go out to you know the moons of Uranus or Neptune, and and if you could find some kind of bizarre life there. Uh, then you might very well have uh, evidence that you know, and, th- and like I said, it's not going to be something where uh, you know, uh, Carolyn Porco stands up at a press conference and say we found life on Enceladus. Therefore, we know but, that we we know it was an independent genesis. It's going to be more. In- here's an interesting dilemma, though, gents. If everything that we know of that exists today, we theorize came from the exact same moment in time, bang, then everything is related. But not everything. biologically, not biologically. Well, if if all of the soup of ingredients were existing simultaneously at one point in time in everywhere, because everywhere was, well, everywhere, then everything is going to be related i i, mm, I don't know well no the, the question the question is marcia we don't know if the genesis of biology is an extremely rare event or extremely common event or somewhere in between we just don't know that and that's what we're trying to figure out because uh-huh. we, we from one sample you can't tell that yeah okay so uh yeah, we probably all have every, everywhere in the universe. You have the same laws of physics. You probably have the same basic matter and energy. Uh, in fact, there seems to be a very strong evidence that that's the case. Uh, so, but the main variable is distribution. It seems to me that's the only thing you're talking about. The 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 ingredients all seem to be essentially the same because they were hatched out of the same egg, so to speak. But the the distribution of these known things is what is making the variety of what we well, see. We I'd just say. simply don't know how often chemical elements come together in a way that re- results in in self replication. Uh-huh. Once that self-replication and this harvesting of the free energy in the environment happens, you have life, and you have, and you know, all hell breaks loose wherever that wherever you are. But we don't know. We don't know if that happened one time in the whole history of the universe, or if it happens quadrillions of times. Continuous. Yeah. J- Jason Huey just uh, he just pulled his quite his statement, but he made an interesting statement that. Uh, I believe according to the Drake equation, the average lifespan of a species on Earth is around 10 million years. Well, that, that has nothing to do with the Drake equation. Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with the Drake equation. But yeah, there, well, he, there are he, average lifespans of species calculated. Yeah. I think it's closer to well, 4 he, million He pulled years. it as I was reading it, and I saw Drake equation, and then... Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can have... Uh, I, I, it's not clear to me that the lifespans of civilizations, the lifespans of species are, are, 
you know, one to one mapping, but uh no, well, it seems pretty unlikely. But but implicit, I'd like to point out that um, implicit in Marshall's remarks are something pretty important, though, because, uh, talking about everything coming out of the same stew pot, basically, because we do know that basic organic molecules are very widely represented in the universe. And you can produce those, the, the, the famous uh, Stanley Miller and the, the Ur Uray, uh, experiment back in the 50s where they put a bunch of uh, chemicals in a jar and put lightning bolts through them and they got you know really basic uh, uh, organic molecules it's a long way from the macromolecules of, of RNA or DNA but the basic constituents are there and as if 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 as Paul said that the, the chemistry and physics are pretty much the same everywhere in the universe, it's gonna produce those same basic organic molecules, which would be the building blocks of life. And it just becomes a question of where are the conditions right for those basic building blocks to assemble themselves into macromolecules that can self-replicate. That's the unknown at this point. Yeah. Into life forms that we can discern. Well, even if you, you look know. at the top ten. <clears throat> Look at the top 10 elements that exist in the universe. You've got hydrogen, which is by far the, the biggest component, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, iron, all the stuff that we're made of. The most common elements in the universe are the, is the stuff that we are made of. So if you look at it from that point of view, it doesn't seem that unlikely that life is going to exist elsewhere. Yes, yes. Distributed in a way that makes self-replicable life forms. It probably isn't all that unusual. That's life, my guess. Life is a very complicated arrangement of those molecules. Yeah, it, it, the, yeah go ahead. What really interests us, even if we're not saying it, though, is where it gets complex enough that it interests us, because the universe is is probably there's probably a lot of microbial life out there, but we're not going to be talking to it anytime soon. Yeah. No, but just just to know that it exists, then that is your takeoff point. If you know that exists. Right. Yeah, that so, would be yeah huge. That, that's. That's why if, if we if we find microbes elsewhere in our solar system, like Paul said, he expected to find fossil life on Mars. I wouldn't be surprised by that. And and in yeah. the subsurface ocean, ocean oceans of the Jovian satellites, yeah, yeah. Once you know it's there, it certainly it whets your appetite to know where it might have gotten more complex on a rocky mm -hmm. planet in the habitable zone of a of a main sequence star. Obviously, well, if yeah. we do find, it, it's going to be microbial. It's a fair bet that, that we are going to find microbial life before we find anything else. That doesn't make I mean, sense uh, to me. That doesn't make sense because, uh, let me put this in, life is going to find us. Those higher life forms are going to find us. Probably, I would submit, coming where I come from, the experiences I have, I think higher life forms are going to find us before we find lower life forms. Well, that, that would be the, the zoo hypothesis, right? Which we'll talk about in another episode. The what uh, hypothesis? The zoo, that they found us and they're just leaving us alone. <laughs> yeah, they're smart enough to leave us alone. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nick, wrote a, Nick did a, a recent wow signal burst on uh, the wilderness hypothesis, which is kind of a variation on that. Uh, but, um, that, that's, uh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get into that. It's a future episode. Um, the, uh, the, the, the I think Adam's, Adam's probably right. I, I talk to any scientist who studied the problem. They fully expect that there's microbial life all over the universe. Uh, and, and any place that there could be microbial life there probably is microbial life. uh by microbial what we mean of course is some kind of very very simple self-replicating system like we had during the boring billion right the the billion years plus maybe two billion years on the history of the earth where there was nothing but microbes and yeah now paul this brings up another question just self-replicating you have to you have to drill down into that too. Uh, pretty soon we'll be able to make self-replicating 
machines and mm -hmm. that is not life but we could you know encounter very basic little self-replicating machines i think there's a name for it i can't think of it right now for, for no for no machines okay yeah. we might encounter those now then we would have to think that okay this is self-replicating but it is not life as far as we know but then you're going to kind of go to the obvious question then if this is not life as we know something built that to be able to replicate we're well, going to run into that too it's the extended phenotype of that life that we don't know uh you know our machines are us see but, that's, but that's, they, they are life. extraterrestrial artifacts it's an artifact of life. It's an extraterrestrial artifact. It's so, an indicator that there was life that that imbued yeah. this with the ability to be a mechanical device. Yes, it certainly would presuppose that. Though, 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 we may find things that it's very difficult to us to determine whether or not they're artifacts or not. This this goes yeah. back to the, the the famous artifact of the excuse me the famous story of the. Um, watch found on the beach and inferring an, uh, an artificer from the nature of the artifice and it's it's an old uh, chestnut of, of of the design argument so that yeah. it gets in a whole other area of philosophy we won't touch on now well richard dockers wrote a whole book on that right uh blank watch which, yeah it's a good book too um mm -hmm. but uh, of course it, it's just a metaphor for that book but uh the yeah i mean well the other the other thing nick i don't know if you heard of this uh but uh, a counterpoint to Arthur T. Clarke's uh, third law is that any uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. Magic. Uh, no, no. Well, that was what Arthur C. Clarke said. Magic. Yeah. Uh, there's a version. There's a version of that that I really like from Rachel Armstrong, who said any sufficiently advanced civilization is indistinguishable from nature, and I, I agree with that, and I think it's an important observation. Which is very different from the whole Kardashev uh, yeah. uh, hierarchy. So, uh, yeah. and I, we should probably think about that some more. But the 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 point there is that uh, we don't really know if uh, you know. But but we do we do but we do know the following. I think we do. I think it's reasonable, reason very reasonable assumption, if nothing else, that any life, whatever that we find in the universe, is going to have begun from very primitive life, and probably taken a long time to evolve from that. I don't know if we can assume that either. I don't well, assume that. Well, I mean, I don't know how you. It, it, you just it's just the probabilities are are. Mind-blowingly large. Yeah, that's against... just thinking too small. I don't. I... Uh, Say that um... to Charles Darwin. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, well, God. Well, it's think... into a whole different thing here too. But Dar Darwin's been pretty thoroughly vindicated on this planet. Uh, no, right. no, 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 oh. no, 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 no. There, Darwin goes. Believe. The theory, the theory of evolution goes to a point, but Darwin did not prove that uh, a horse was once um, a crab. So well, that, that, that's a very deceptive way of putting it. And Darwin yeah. never yeah, said, yeah. set out to point that a horse was. He a never crab. said that. Yeah. He said, yeah, no, they, no, no. They have Everything... they have a common ancestor, as we have a common ancestor with the crab. It's just a question of how far in the past that common ancestor is. Quite far, uh, it's like hundreds of millions of years. Related. Everybody here on the panel right now is related. Okay, but, but, but yeah. tell, now wait a second. On the theory of evolution, you know, he had to go back and modify that because then you see these huge jump, these periods of nothing happening, and then huge jumps of things happening. And that came from not just nature, but that came from the interaction of something else. So, you know, I... I just don't blanket think that that that's the end all be all for the question of well, how we got to be. Here. Darwin himself did not know very much about heritability uh, because this, there was no molecular biology in his day. But uh, he essentially showed well, that Linus figured that out pretty quick. But but I I just no, it wasn't Pauling. It was Mendel. Not uh, yeah, <laughs> Linus and and uh, Gregor Mendel. Correct. Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel, okay. He he figured 
all that at works in well, together, but I, I just can't buy the, I'll just stop there. But, you know, that isn't the answer to everything, that we all started from a primordial soup and everything became what we know today just from that, you know, um, marinating. No, no. Well, no, it was so. marinated. It was it was driven forward by 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 climate and and changing positions of of the continents and and divisions of continents that opened up the possibilities of adaptive radiation. The sea going up and down that sometimes made some areas of land island and sometimes connected them. And there's repeated uh, separations and reintroductions over a period of of billion years. And that is true to a point. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. It makes perfectly good sense and it answers that to a point. But then there becomes a point where, um, you know, it does not answer smartly. It doesn't answer smartly. It answers in a dogma way, but I don't think it answers. No, there's, there's, there's nothing dogmatic about about evolutionary theory. If you, if you re actually, if you get out of the public debate and you actually read the books written in biology today and, and, and the papers written by biologists, there's absolutely nothing dogmatic about it. No. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of evidence that that I mean the if you read I would recommend, Marsha, read Jerry Coyne's book, uh, Why Evolution is True. It, well, it's does, very, does, puts it in very, very basic terms about the the five major lines of evidence that, that all point in the same direction. And, for example, we have endogenous retroviruses in our DNA that we share with chimpanzees. There's no way for that to happen unless we have a common ancestor. Yeah, but how, you know, I'm, I find question, questionable the fact that o almost in a snap of a time, we, we grew this Broca speech center. You know, that didn't... No. That, Oh, not in a yeah, snap of time. Uh, well, in a very oh. short period of time, when you're talking about slime over eons over eons, we got some pretty elegant mechanisms in a pretty quick time span that nothing else had. Tens of thousands of generations. That, that, but that, 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 you don't find any other hominid that has a broken speech center. Well, we don't have any other hominid. Is where this whole no, there's hominid. nothing. Yeah, they, they're they're all dead. We, we killed them all. No, them I'm, all. Talking about, I'm talking about. So we don't have any Paleontology doesn't show you any. But anyway, I don't want to keep going over this. We, well, we're going to have to agree to disagree. We'll have to agree to disagree show, to a certain point. Ne Neanderthals couldn't speak. No, no, they didn't well, have the the mechanism to. But well, you know, there, I don't there's more than like one way to speak. Let me just say this: I don't want to sound like a nutcase saying I don't believe in evolution. I believe I do. I do not believe it answers everything properly, concisely, to my satisfaction. And you guys are much more learned than I, so I understand what you're well, saying. I just don't buy it. At Marcia, give point. give us some references from the show notes uh, that where you think there's there's uh, unanswered questions or infelicitous explanations. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. That's just like too damn home, too much homework to do, Paul. <laughs> well, I'm that's, retired. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, science is hard. So we're going to we're going to appeal to Mount in, the 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 steep side of Mount Improbable and not be willing to walk up the back side of it. <laughs> maybe, maybe some wonks will write in and say such and such and so and so. But but you know this this is one of these things that uh, we could argue till we're blue in the face. But you know all of the information isn't in, so we don't know who's right on this. I know you guys are convinced you are because you're scientists, and um, uh, well, at any rate, I'm not. No, I'm a, I'm just a lowly engineer, actually. Uh, you're a scientist, Paul. For the love of God, man. No, no, All right, no, anyway, no. let's move on. I don't want to keep kicking this okay. dead horse. Me. Okay. Uh, so I'd like each of you to tell me, kind of, give me, give me sort of like a, you know, I, I don't know where, where you started and where you, if we're all, James is probably the youngest of us. Uh, I'm probably the oldest. Uh, but, you know, how how has, we don't have to go around the table or anything, but somebody chime in with how has the ex the golden age of exoplanet discovery affected your view of the world of the universe? I'll jump on that uh, if nobody else wants to take it up right away, which is the 
the incredible variety of different kinds of planets that have been found have been absolutely um, fascinating. Of course, uh, there was because of the bias of the sample towards short period, large, close planets, a lot of hot Jupiters or hot Jovian planets were found early on. Very large planets circling very close to their stars very rapidly, sometimes method. As our technology improves, Ed, I think we will see a similar astonishing variety of, of small rocky planets. You know, we were just, somebody was saying earlier about, we have detected a few possible mars size planets, but uh, it, there's, it, it's entirely possible that there may be entirely entire solar systems that have large number of dwarf planets that we still can't detect. And I expect we'll see a, a great range of, of small planets that we cannot detect now as our technology improves and as methods of search improve. I'll tell you how it's affected me, Paul. I, Go ahead. I find it a, a wonderful rebuking of some who said, oh no, there wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be any planets outside our solar system, blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, what scientist could be so narrow that they could not imagine they were out there and out there so plentiful. Um, and I'm glad that the uh, the recent discoveries of that has rebuked that notion. Okay. Anybody else? I'm interested in the super Earths, the, the planets that are slightly bigger than Earth and the, the possibilities for life on those planets because a planet that's, say one and a half times the size of Earth, may well be very similar to Earth. It may have very similar oceans, continents, very similar atmosphere, but it will have much heavier gravity. And that might lead to a, a completely different pathway for life. It's going to have to struggle against very, very, well, maybe um, a a thick atmosphere will create greater pressure or just the gravity will uh, it, it could produce forms of, of life that have to hug the ground or stay in the sea it's a lot easier to maintain buoyancy in an ocean mm -hmm. is life able to get out of the oceans on worlds with greater gravity or thicker atmospheres things like that interest me All right and that those are things that are still very much an area of current research. So well, yeah, it's yeah. very speculative at the moment, but and if a civilization Oh, go ahead, Nick. And if a civilization developed on a planet with heavier gravity, how much greater the challenge would be to get into orbit and get into space? Hmm. Absolutely. Well, yeah, it would I I think it would be a greater challenge. Uh but probably not insurmountable. I mean, we never, we well, never, nice, we never said, "Oh my goodness, if the Earth was just a little bit bigger, we wouldn't be able to build rockets." You know, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, probably I, can figure it out. I think about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's okay. Anybody else? Or before we go to our recommendations. You all have your recommendations ready? Oh, my God. I didn't know we had to have recommendations. Okay, so Archer doesn't have one. All right. Uh, I guess there, here's my, wait, here's my recommendation. Consider more strongly directed panspermia as an answer to some of the things we find. And now, directed panspermia. Okay. All right. That's uh, what I'm a proponent of at this point in my development. Directed panspermia. That's okay. Okay. Uh, Adam, how about you? Marsha mentioned the comet 67P, uh, Cheremeov Gerasimenko, to give it its full name. Oh, my uh, gosh. She, she was saying that they. I've never said those words out loud myself. <laughs> <laughs> she was saying that they discovered uh, water and molecular oxygen. There's a new website that uh, the European Space Agency's. Um, the, the OSIRIS team that run the OSIRIS camera on uh, Rosetta have created a dedicated website for their images. And I don't know off the top of my head the web address, but I shall give it to you, Paul, to put in the show notes. It's the okay, OSIRIS yes. 
picture of the day website. Hmm. Cool. Yes, yeah, please, please, uh, please uh, forward any recommendations uh, for the show notes. Uh, okay, how about you, James? Uh, I'm going to recommend a music group that I listen to an awful lot, and it's just fun watching Paul and sing and dance to them. Uh, <laughs> Apelic Storm. They are a uh, Irish band. They play a lot of Irish folk songs, which is something I grew up listening to my grandpa singing. But they also have a lot of rock songs, you know, not quite as, as heavy as like Flogging Molly, but they've got some pretty, they got some pretty good music. So okay. I think you might even like it all. Oh, I might. Yeah, I might very well. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, depending on how much, how much Irish whiskey I've had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, just, uh, Darcy's Drunken Donkey. <laughs> just find, that, find that song. I like those guys already if they can name a tune that Darcy's Drunken Donkey. Uh, <laughs> okay, and uh, Nick? I would like to uh, recommend a paper that's already appeared uh, so far in this discussion, although I didn't name it specifically. Uh, it came out on archive. Uh, site uh, either the 30th of November or the 1st of December, Dynamical Considerations for Life in Multi-Habitable Planetary Systems by Jason Steffen and a fellow with an Asian name that I can't pronounce, although the last name is Lee, L-I. Uh, this addresses something I've thought about many times but never before seen a scientific treatment of, the possibility of, of uh, planets in in close proximity the last sentence here of the abstract says our results indicate that close proximity planet pairs in multi-habitable systems are conducive to life in the system and i think it's a fascinating idea of there being uh, several planets in close proximity that might trade their uh, uh, living material through lithopanspermia which we've been mentioning several times All right great uh and my recommendation uh is i've done a couple of books uh one cd box set uh but i will uh, my recommendation for this week is another book uh and it's probably one that you, somebody gave you last year uh but you should you should go get it out and read it this time it's called it's called what if and it's by randall monroe and since you're about to get his other book for Christmas called The Thing Explainer, uh, make sure you get What If. It's an easy, uh, breezy read, a lot of fun. Uh, and in What If, he uh, proposes a lot of very, very strange and unlikely scenarios. Then it actually tries to kind of work out the details of what would happen in a humorous and uh, way. Although some of the things that he looks at are... Very likely catastrophic, <laughs> but uh, I think you'll enjoy it. And it, it's a, a sort of one of these old ages books that uh, uh, anywhere from a fifth grader to an adult can enjoy. So uh, that's What If by Randall Monroe, who's the uh, the guy behind the uh, brilliant cartoon XKCD. So uh, I think that's it for tonight. I think we're going to stop here. Uh it, you know, it, it makes me think we probably should go through the, the next three terms in the Drake equation uh, at, in some order. Uh, and uh, and each, because each one is worth uh, a long... Uh, well, we basically, we've done the first three uh, and we have decent estimates for them. But the, next, the, ne uh, the next four terms are all kind of and we talked about the fourth term tonight, but the next three after that are all very controversial. So, uh, you have a, have fun talking about that. Uh, so now we will have a sh recorded show next week, um, on the 18th of December. That will be our last one of 2015. So if you're looking on your RSS feed and wonder why there's no unseen podcast on Christmas uh, well, it's because we took the week off. We're also taking the following week off. Uh, so we'll be back on January 8th. And we'll record one on January 8th. And it'll be out the 8th or 9th, depending on your time zone. 
So, uh, see you then uh, next week. And we have not decided on the topic yet. Uh, so, guys, get on get on that topic thread and let's uh, let's converge on something interesting. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to say it's going to be the fifth term of the direct equation. <laughs> All right. Uh, this has been the Unseen Podcast. It's episode 36. And we will see you next time. Uh, go to unseenpodcast.com for more information. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.